Today, our guest is New York Times best-selling author, Irene Spencer. Welcome, Irene. Thank you so much for having me. This is really a pleasure. We want to talk today about your wonderful books. Your book that hit the New York Times bestseller list, Shattered Dreams, went to the top of the charts and made you known everywhere. Will you tell us how did you come to write a book like this? Well, my book was called Shattered Dreams, My Life as a Polygamist's Wife. And the reason that I wrote it is because uh, we were told to not tell anybody about what we believed, to not let anybody know the workings inside of a cult, and, and we were told not to betray the brethren. And you were in really deep water if you... Uh, revealed anything that happened you were to keep your mouth shut pretend that everything was fine always put a smile on your face and be happy and put on this facade that life is wonderful in in polygamy so um, i decided that i was going to write it and let the world know that i will no longer sit by and to tolerate abuse in the name of religion and that's why i wrote this book this is quite amazing. You speak about polygamy. Was it a continuum in your family? Was it in your history? How did you come about to be involved in polygamy? Well, I was one of the uh, many that were born into it. In uh, 1834, uh, or, uh, when Joseph Smith introduced polygamy into the uh, Mormon church, my ancestors got on the bag bandwagon and uh, got numerous wives, and I am five-generation polygamist. My grandmother was a second wife. My mom was a second wife. So naturally, I became a second wife. And I married a man that had ten wives. I was the second of his ten wives, and he had 58 children. You heard right. I said 58 children. He had 29 girls and 29 boys. And uh, I mothered 14 of those children who were, were mine. And so anyway, uh, that's how I happened to uh, be, be in it. You know, you mentioned not betraying the brethren, and there was a note of, a note of heavy-handedness in the emotion of that statement. Were you held into this religion by faith or by fear? Well, fear is what uh, uh, controls everything. Fate had me in it, but fear kept me there. And uh, you're told that you're going, if you don't live polygamy, you're told that you're going to go straight to hell and burn forever. Well, you don't want to do that, so of course you go into it and say you love it and put a little smile on your face and try to make the very best of it. But I want to ask you, how do you think you can be happy uh, when you have to attend your husband's weddings? when you have to have other women move in with you, when you see the advances he makes to, uh, to other women uh, in your presence, uh, it, it literally strips away everything that you hold dear as a woman, and uh, it takes it away. And I uh, decided that I was going to write and uh, tell about it. And uh, there is a fear, though, because uh, they have what they call blood atonement, and uh, it's uh, people have actually put people to death for betraying the brethren and, and going too far and saying too much. So, you know, and that has there. gone And that has gone on in this generation. Abs oh, absolutely. I've seen it with my, I've, I've seen it with my own eyes. And we do know that that is what your second book, Cult and Sanity, is about. And so after we discuss this one, we're going to discuss that one because you are definitely a dynamic author and these two books are very different even though they're based on one life, one concept of a very expanded, expanded indeed in many directions reality. Well, I figured if people could see the uh, problems, the pain, the heartache, the suffering that I had gone through and that I could rise above it, that it might give them courage to do something about their lives. And that means any woman, you don't even have to be in polygamy. I've had hundreds of emails from women 
just out there that weren't of any religion, but their husband was going to take another wife and going to bring her home and, and was ruining their relationship. And I've been able to counsel many people uh, by doing this. And it's really funny, but, you know, I found my purpose in life. And through the suffering and what I've been through, God has prepared me to be able to help the next person and, you know, and do something about their lives. And that's what I want to do is just pursue my uh, goal and let people know that we are not victims. Most of us think that we're martyrs or that we're victims, but we are victors. And when we claim our own identity... And when we say, you know, I am worth something, I value, I'm going to run my own life, then we become empowered. And that's the beautiful thing because uh, we become empowered that we can live our own life. And we have a right to be wrong. We have a right to change our minds. We have a right as women to be loved and to be needed and uh, to have her life, uh, you know, have a life and have an education. And that's the reason that I wrote this book, because I want people to know that I don't care where you've come from, uh, no person or no circumstance can ever keep one from one's destiny. I understand that you were born here in the United States, but the scene, the primary scene that takes place in Shattered Dreams is in Mexico. Is that not so? Uh, yes, I married into the group, the LeBaron group, that uh, in the state of Chihuahua, Mexico. And in 1953, when I was uh, 16, I moved to Mexico and uh, as a second wife. And most of the time I lived there, yes. I understand that there are different polygamist groups from Canada to Mexico and other places. Are you uh, privy to that information? Oh, absolutely. In fact, I think I'm related to everybody in every group. The biggest uh, group in Salt Lake, the Apostolic Brethren, United Apostolic Brethren out of Salt Lake City, was my Uncle Ruin Allred. Uh, it was his church, and he was my mother's brother. And uh, I've had, we, we have family members in the Kingston group, in the Canada group, in the Colorado City group. And, and uh, in fact, when they had El Dorado, Texas raids, People remember they hauled the women off in buses and were going to relocate them. I It was like deja vu to me because my father had been arrested when I was seven, and we had that fear of being taken away from our families. And uh, But I can identify with it because I had five sisters in that group. So I don't care which group you're in. Uh, I know most of them. Uh, most of them are related to us. And what people don't know is that there's close to 50 to 100,000 estimated people in the United States and Canada that are living polygamy today, and most people are, are not even aware that it even goes on. How do they support these families? Well, they say, let God support them. And he usually comes in the guise of the county welfare and food stamps. And uh, so he does a pretty good job. How do these polygamist families hide? Isn't this illegal? Do they hide? How do they handle that? Well, that's why they have their own schools. They homeschool their children. They don't ha let them read magazines. They don't let them have TV. They don't let them go to movies outside uh, functions. The uh, boys go out when they're 15 years old to go to work and help support the family so their dad can marry younger and more wives. The girls are married off very young so that they can have 15 to 20 some odd children. And, uh, uh, you know, life goes on. In your book, Shattered Dreams, you were living a life that would be, comparatively speaking, a, a lifestyle of 100 years ago. It was without modern conveniences. It was extremely rugged, I think would be the correct word. Will you comment on that? Uh, yes, I w went for, I think, 17 years where I didn't have any electricity at all. Had to pull water out of a well. I grew my own gardens, milk to cow, uh, canned a little fruit that I could. Uh, anyway, it's, uh, we live very, uh, on a very poverty level. In reading your book, Shattered Dreams, the poverty level seemed to be so extreme that it would make the natural concept of poor folks look pretty darn good in this country. I mean, comparatively <laughs> Ab speaking, Ab poor folks were rich folks by the time <laughs> I was reading this book. Absolutely. Absolutely.
the concept of the women standing together, even though being torn apart emotionally by their emotional needs not being met, was very powerful in this book. Will you comment on that, please? Well, you know, I will say that the women, at least, we loved each other, and I can truly say that we loved each other. We tried to be fair. We tried to fulfill each other's needs and uh, tried to do what was right. And we actually had a bond with them because we were with them more so than we were with the husband. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of very good people that get caught up in here in this kind of a lifestyle that are trying to serve God, and they are just victims of circumstances like I was. But we can change our circumstances. We can move on. We don't have to say, hey, uh, you know, there's nothing I can do because there's always something you can do. Is there a great deal of pain and unhappiness in polygamy, more so than joy? Uh, you know, you can see it etched in their faces, see the despair and the loneliness, and, and it's just really, it's sad. You know, you just look at some of these plural wives, look in their faces and see what they're going through. They don't even have to speak. You can see what they're going through. In your book, you indicated that having a child as often as possible, what was the timeline on that, having a child? And what's the doctrine on that? Well, they say to not let a year go by without seeing that a child isn't brought into this uh, holy principle of plural marriage. The reason being is that these men need these children for future spirits because they are going to become gods. And uh, if they get their quota of seven wives and a bunch of children, they get to have their own world and go to heaven and become gods. So that's what they're working and striving for. Uh, forgive me for saying so, but according to what I've read in your book, it seems like heaven for a woman is the same hell on earth she just endured, except she's crowned with the title of goddess. Uh, am I misinterpreting that? That's actually one of the first things that woke me up, because I realized one day, after much pain and heartache and suffering, that uh, I was going to go to hell. And I realized that I didn't have to wait to go to heaven and be sent to hell because I was living in hell. Anything had to be better than what I was going through. And I've seen women go through nervous breakdowns. I've seen people have, you know, commit suicide. And, and I have, you know, I had nine nieces and nephews, the first cousin that committed suicide. When I see the heartache of all the things that has happened and I've seen people murdered and you know, finally you just have to say, you know, anything's got to be better than this. I've got to move on, you know. The lifestyle that you lived in Mexico was extremely primitive. The book is profound because I see women pulling together because they're in a common hell where they start out, it seems like, with a great deal of pain, allegedly assumed caused by each other from marrying the same man. Is that correct? Correct. 